Next will be Kitty Simons, Executive Director of the Western Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, after Ms. Simons, we will have Ms. Beth Lowell, the Deputy Vice President of, for US, U.S. Campaigns at Oceania. And finally, we'll have uh, Ms. Jen Theanto Kemmerle, Director of Global Fisheries and Aquaculture at Monterey Bay Aquarium. Let me just uh, remind the witnesses under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but the entire statement will appear uh, in the record. When you begin, the lights on the witness table will turn green. After four minutes, you'll see a yellow light come on to tell you you should begin winding up, and of course, you know what the, uh, the red light means. I will uh, also allow the entire panel to testify before uh, members begin their questioning of the witnesses. The chair now recognizes Ms. Judy Gerhardt. Thank you. Chairman Huffman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here to testify on the state of fisheries and fishers. Since 2012, my organization, the International Labor Rights Forum, has been documenting and reporting on human rights abuses in the global seafood supply chain. We are advocating for greater legal protections for vulnerable migrant workers and have piloted a program to test connectivity at sea so that we can both improve catch documentation to prevent IUU fishing, and survey fishers about their situation. Since 2013, we've been coordinating the Thai Seafood Working Group, a coalition of more than 60 labor, human rights, environmental, and civil society organizations, which are working on the intersection of human trafficking and IUU fishing. I want to share with you some of the challenges in protecting seafood workers' rights. I'll draw on examples from our work in Thailand in order to illustrate the depth of work and coordination that's needed by both governments and industries alike. My conclusions will emphasize the need for greater transparency and accountability. The nexus between IUU and human trafficking is clear. In fact, IUU is made possible by the unfettered abuse of seafood workers. Fewer fish means vessels must go further out to sea and fish for longer periods of time using unsustainable methods, many of which fall under IUU fishing. And in order to afford the higher cost of distant water fishing, Underhand operators turn to illegal trafficking networks to supply cheap labor at the expense of vulnerable populations, often migrant workers. Thus, the same lack of monitoring and control enforcement that allows IU fishing to deter conservation goals and deplete fish stocks is simultaneously contributing to the exploitation of workers in the fishing sector. Forced labor and the associated crime of human trafficking has been documented in supply chains in many seafood exporting countries including Thailand, Taiwan, South Korea, Indonesia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. My written testimony provides details on all the efforts being made by the Royal Thai government to address forced labor and human trafficking. Since 2014, progress has been made in terms of new laws and policies intended to protect migrant fishers in particular. But significant problems continue and leaders in the Thai seafood industry are resisting change. This was documented in a 2018 report by the ILO about the continuing problems. The prevention of human trafficking requires workers to have the means to speak out confidentially without fear of reprisal and to secure remedy. Yet in Thailand, the complex documentation process for migrant workers means many are still paying recruitment fees that put them in debt bondage. Additionally, the restrictions on migrant workers' ability to join trade unions and seek remedy further inhibit their ability to, to, um, to, to have a better situation. And in several cases, workers who did report labor abuses against certain companies were charged in criminal defamation suits for harming the company's reputation. Finally, fishers on boats are particularly vulnerable, as they usually have no means to communicate with support networks while they're at sea. The challenges to effective reform in Thailand illustrate how much more needs to be done. As a human rights organization, we believe national level reforms and enforcement are absolutely necessary and it's the duty of each state to protect the workers employed by the companies it governs. But global competition among seafood producing countries will continually limit and create disincentives for national governments' ability to protect workers' rights. For this reason, initiatives to prevent IUU and stop human trafficking in seafood must consider market-oriented solutions that can address the role of global corporations and how they might and seek a way for global corporations to be enlisted in the preservation of our oceans and the protection of seafood workers' rights. I have three specific recommendations. One is for the U.S. to take the lead on transparency and accountability. 
Federal legislation promoting greater transparency and accountability in corporate supply chains is needed. The UK, Australia, France, and Netherlands, and other US allies have recently passed laws requiring multinational corporations to publicly disclose what efforts they are making to address the risk of forced labor in global supply chains. The US should join and take the lead and set and lead by example in developing that legislation as well. The second is enforcement of existing US laws. More robust enforcement of Section 1307 of the Tariff Act, which bans the importation of products made in whole or in part with forced labor is important. We believe that leveraging greater data within the SIM legislation can also contribute to the enforcement of the Tariff Act. The second is clarity from the US government on how they enforce Executive Order 13627, which requires US government contractors to certify they have implemented anti-human trafficking compliance <coughs> before, they, before they buy products. And the third is really we're calling on for a new social environmental pact. There are precedents for a social environmental pact between civil society and global corporations. There's one in Bangladesh that's been transforming the industry in fire safety and building safety. And there's one in Florida by the coalition of the Mockley workers in the tomato industry. We believe that <coughs> the coming together of civil society and corporations could be incentivized by government programs and policies in order to create a program with um, transparency, a meaningful role for workers, legal recourse for workers, and a commitment from local companies. Thank Sarah, you. I need to cut you off on such an important subject.